this thing, cycle 24 solar maximum is a dud? Absolutely. The uh, average sunspot count for this when it's all said and done will probably be uh, almost uh, exactly what I predicted it would be back in 07 and 08. Uh, NASA had indicated that this would be one of the most active cycles on record. Uh, I contacted NASA's top solar physicist back then and said, you're off by 100% in your math and in your calculations. Of course, they didn't pay any attention to me, but as it turns out, it looks like I was dead on. The numbers are very close to the 74 sunspot count I predicted versus the NASA count of over 145. So this is truly one of the weakest in 100 years. And In fact, uh, you have to go back to... Uh, to 1880 to um, find a solar cycle with the same dynamics uh, as this one. Uh, and yes, to your other question, we expect the next solar cycles, number 25 and number 26, to possibly be the weakest in 200 to 400 years, all of which means a new cold climate is coming, at least for those of us that follow climate change based on the sun. All right, give our listeners a, you know, a layman's version of the science behind um, how a solar cycle affects or the number of sunspots, how it affects the weather here on Earth, or I should say the climate. The sunspot count, which is the primary tool for evaluating climate change among the group of scientists uh, worldwide that I belong to, is really... Uh, quite a feature of the sun. It truly represents whether the sun is active or inactive. The more sunspots the sun has, the more active it is. The fewer sunspots, the less active it is. And a less active sun means you have less solar wind, less magnetic field, less radiation hitting the earth, less energy from the sun warming the earth, and that's the crucial factor. What we now know is that when the sun goes into these uh, naturally predictable cycles of diminished activity, which we measure by sunspot count, we know that the earth gets cold because the sun is no longer warming us to the degree it used to. And what uh, what amount of change are we looking at in in the cooling of the sun? You know, a lot of people are, you know, that's a concept It's hard for them to even comprehend. What do you mean the, the sun is getting cooler? How could that be uh, happening? But what are we talking about? What what type of fluctuation in the energy output of the sun, and how does that affect our climate here on, on planet Earth? Well, it's, it's pretty much like uh, you're going to a campground, and at night everyone stands around the campfire. Well, as the campfire... Uh, burns lower and lower, you get cooler. Uh, And that's pretty much what's happening with the sun. The sun is not generating the same amount of energy that it did before, and we, in effect, get colder. This manifests itself in fundamental climate change. The last um, time this happened, to the degree we're estimating, was back in the early 1800s. And you're absolutely right. Most people can't understand it. And it's because this is a 206-year cold cycle of the sun. And uh, there were very few uh, Americans back then. Only about 5 million Americans, uh, not including Native Americans, were in the U.S. at that time. This is back in the days of Washington, Jefferson, and Adams as our first presidents. And uh, so, uh, yeah, no one really has seen the kind of weather, the kind of climate, and the kind of cold we're about to go into. So even though it sounds somewhat scary to, to contemplate that the sun is winding down, at the same time, it's actually normal behavior. It's happened throughout the history of the universe. Exactly. Uh, we're only talking about uh, natural cycles of the sun, which if properly evaluated, uh, do show that they're uh, very repeatable, very predictable, Uh, which led to my relational cycle theory and my predictions for climate change back in 2007. And we've seen all of those major predictions come to fruition after all this time. Um, 
I predicted the sun would go into hibernation. NASA was just the opposite, saying it wouldn't. I predicted that uh, the oceans would cool, the atmospheres would cool, and that a new cold climate would begin. And all of those things have come to pass. Uh, I might add to that that I later predicted an increase in earthquake and volcanic activity, which we also saw during that last uh, solar hibernation, as we call it, the cold phase of the sun that comes by every 206 years. While we're on the subject of, of volcanoes, it appears to me that there's there's an increase in volcanic activity right now, seismic activity around volcanoes. I mean, I'm seeing stories almost every week around the world about another volcano coming back to life. And, and right now, the Japanese uh, people are talking about the pressure that's building under uh, Mount Fuji. That's correct. One of our chief scientists in our uh, geology group, the International Earthquake and Volcano Prediction Center, is quite concerned about uh, Mount Fuji. And in fact, there are a number of prominent volcanoes. Uh, Sakurajima, for example, is, is getting active again, and it's right next to a major city. Uh, the challenge the Japanese face in the future, we believe, is enduring more record earthquake and volcanic activity over the next 30 years. Um, have you given thought to uh, the impact that the world would would experience if Mount Fuji erupted? Well, Mount Fuji is uh, not only one of the more striking and photographed uh, volcanoes because of its prominent uh, conical structure and the the beauty of the land around it, but uh, when it does blow its top, it's quite violent. A lot of the uh, volcanoes in the uh, Japanese archipelago are violent, erupting volcanoes. And yes, it would be a very substantial event. The, the plume, the cloud, the dust that would come out of that would blanket uh, much of the greater Tokyo area where you've got 30 million people. And uh, so it would be of, of genuine concern, could even be a globally impacting concern if that particular volcano were to erupt. But on the other hand, uh, we already have some had some major eruptions down in the, the normal hot spot for volcanoes, which is the Indonesian area. We've had several major eruptions uh, already within the last year that shut down air, air traffic, uh, from Southeast Asia to Australia. So uh, although we don't see much press coverage of anything in the Southern Hemisphere, for that matter, they've already had a string of very large eruptions down there. And, and then we have this uh, report in recent weeks about the highway asphalt melting, uh, it, you know, at the Yellowstone uh, National Park. Have, have you heard about this, about the asphalt yes, I melting? Have. Yeah. I, seen some of the photos of the uh, the melting road by one of the geysers there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the U.S. public, of course, is very well up on the uh, super volcano. Uh, and, of course, the uh, apocaly apocalyptic movie 2012 featured a, an eruption of Yellowstone. Uh, the Yellowstone story, however, is dwarfed by other supervolcanoes that are much more of concern uh, to us than Yellowstone is. We have at least two other supervolcanoes that have far more earthquake activity and far more adjacent volcanic activity than Yellowstone does. Uh, but Yellowstone, of course, gets all the press. I know I've asked you the same question in previous interviews, but why is there a connection between periods of, of global cooling, a mini ice age, and increased seismic activity, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions? I guess the best way to look at that is to look at a speeding car going down the highway and all of a sudden you slam on the brakes. Everyone in the car gets thrown forward. There's lots of noise. Uh, energy get, of motion gets converted to heat energy in the brake system. And hopefully you don't have a, a wreck of the reason for the slamming on of the brakes. 
But in, in any case, there's a dramatic energy transfer going on. And that could be a, a rough analogy of what's happening with the sun, when all of a sudden, after uh, do, a dozen or more large 11-year solar cycles, the sun dramatically shuts down or puts the brakes on its energy output. That affects every planet in the solar system, and including the Earth. It, affect, it affects it, uh, as I mentioned, in other ways. The magnetic field varies. The solar wind varies. When you look at all of these effects that the sun delivers to the Earth during this applying of the energy brakes, if you will, uh, it can have a lot of effects. And that seems to be one of them, although the exact mechanism for why we see these record earthquakes and why we see these record volcano eruptions is really not well understood right now. Unfortunately, uh, the president has sucked up all the research money to spend on the myth of global warming. So uh, we don't have a lot of money to put into this kind of really good research field. All right, you mentioned the magnetic field, and just recently there were reports in the news media that scientists are saying that the magnetic field around the planet is weakening much faster than previously estimated. Uh, is that connected to to what's happening on the sun? Uh, undoubtedly it is. The, uh, the sun has, of course, a magnetic field that spans the entire solar system, and it interacts with the magnetic field of those planets like the Earth that has a hot molten core and have generated and created their own magnetic field. It, the interaction of the sun's magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field is complex, but fundamentally um, the magnetic field of the Earth protects us from harmful radiation both from the sun and from outside the solar system. Uh, we, those of us who study the Earth's magnetic field, uh, I wouldn't say are concerned, but quite interested in the very rapid movement of uh, the magnetic poles, both north and south, and the weakening of the Earth's magnetic field. There are some scientists who have indicated that the weakening of the field indicates that the Earth's magnetic field is about to shut down and go through a flip process similar to the sun doing so every 11 years. But in this case, the Earth's magnetic field uh, uh, changes on the order of thousands of years. But they are suggesting, some of them, that we could be seeing a change in the Earth's magnetic field. It'll shut down and then restart with the poles in a reverse position. I want to be very clear on this. There's no instance ever of the Earth physically turning upside down. and. What we're talking about is just a switch in the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, I want to go back to our discussion about the sunspots and how this, you know, I know some listeners are saying, okay, this is all fascinating, but uh, what's it have to do with the price of bread? Well, it actually has a lot to do with the price of bread, doesn't it, John? <laughs> uh, because whenever the planet gets cooler, the cost of wheat and grains and other foodstuffs becomes much higher. And, um, you know, I'm just kind of recalling back to my gardening days. It's been a long time since I've, I've planted a garden because of this job. And I, uh, but, you know, if I, you know, I recall, you know, like sweet corn, uh, th there's a prime, you know, there's a, there's a temperature that corn will grow ideally. You know, at certain temperatures, if we start seeing fluctuations on in the temperature during the growing season, and we're not talking about just a, an anomaly one summer, but year after year for decades, perhaps. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. You can visit us on www.therealthingmean.webs.com.